would you jump through to get a New York City address? Personally, I live in the country, but I can see the appeal of the big city, particularly when I'm commuting home on the train. Now, welcome to Off Duty. I'm Wendy Bounds, and today we're going to tell you about some of the best deals and some of the priciest real estate markets in the United States, and we're going to tell you what to do with all those empty wine barrels I know you have laying around. But first off, where am I? I am in an oasis in a sea of expensive real estate in New York City, where the average home price is about one point four five million. This place, a hundred grand. Who found it? Alyssa Apkowitz did. She's with Smart Money. She's over here cooking me something up. Yeah, cook well, we could if there was power. Well, yes, and, and if you know this was actually hooked up, but it's not right now. A little bit later on the show, you and I are going to sort of walk around, look at what needs some work. First Absolutely. off, though, when you were looking at these real estate markets mm -hmm. around the country, what are some other places you looked at? Where were some, what were some deals you found? You know, it was really surprising because we're looking in luxury real estate markets here. And for example, in Palm Beach, we found a condo for a mere thirty-two thousand dollars in one of the places where the rich and famous you know, go in winter and have expensive brunches. I'm sure it needed no work at all, right? <laughs> well, of course, that's the caveat. And the interesting thing, Wendy, is a lot of these places, as you see, they're amazing deals, but they come with a little asterisk. So you need to put in some sweat equity, or maybe there are some restrictions on how old you can be, or what your income income can be, so that, you know, you can live here. All right, well, you and I are going to get our hands dirty. Yes. You did not wear the right so, outfit, but first, now we're going to find out what some of that... Me. I will, I will soon. But first, we're going to find out what some of the asterisks are on this place. We're going to talk to the realtor. Standing here with Danny Tyson, a realtor in New York City who has found the unthinkable, an apartment selling for $100,000. I don't even know, like, how small is this place? This is about 800 square feet. Whoa, that's That's big. huge for a one bedroom. And it also has an office right off the kitchen. Right off the kitchen. Let me guess, no bathroom then. It's there. It needs some work. <laughs> it needs some <laughs> it needs work. work. Let's find out just how much. All right, we're in. All right, all right. Nothing the little paint can't fix, Danny, so far. Oh, we have more to see. <laughs> Let's see. What's it? This is the bedroom? This is the bedroom. This is big for a Manhattan bedroom, though, a master bedroom. You see a lot smaller. It's still got some of the original detailing, the molding around. Um, all right, I'm good so far. I'm good. I can do a little cleanup. Huge living room, a lot of windows. What would you say the big downfall is in here? <laughs> Let no <laughs> I'm on the floor. All right, I'm just going to let you say it, so let's you say it. So this needs some work. Are there any in this building, are there any income restrictions like for people who want to buy this, this oh, building? Yes. There oh, are. yes. These are HDFCs um, are for low-income people. Okay. And the city has um, come in. He's renovated a number of them. A number of them and they are sold to the original tenant for $250. $250. $250. That's amazing. Who would ever know this is going to happen in to, Harlem? Today, a hundred grand. So we're in what they call Spanish Harlem. Yes. And how does this compare to some of the other real estate properties on this block? Well, we have condos on across the street there, which actually was one of my projects, and million dollar properties over there. And you have a number of other co-ops and condos on this block, the police station, of course, and then you also have Tapestry, which is a, a new rental building. All right, I'm itching, I'm a cook. I'm itching to check out the kitchen. What's that in there? Good size. <laughs> All, right. All right, ready to get cooking? Okay, so the kitchen <laughs> needs just a little bit of work. So when was the last time somebody lived in here? Um, last year. Last year. Right. Wow. It was a renter. A renter. So this apartment has now reverted back to the board. So it really belongs to the people of the building. Hey, have you had any bids on this so far? Yes, I have. I had a lady walk in um, just this week. She looked at it once and said, I want it. Anybody ever just make a bid without ever having seen it? They just know, great neighborhood, want to get in, good space? Actually, a couple of weeks ago, a developer did that. He sent one of his employees, who's not a real estate agent, to one of my open houses on 117th Street. And it was for a townhouse. And I guess when he went back to his boss, told him all the information, plus he took a lot of yeah. pictures. He called me and said, we have a bid. We have a bid. Mm -hmm. All right, I, before I think about making a bid, we gotta check out the rest of the place. Let's see, the, this is the office, this right? This is the office. the office. So why is this technically not billed as a bedroom? Well, this window in the bedroom, or the home office right. as we've uh, <laughs> described it, is against another building. Oh, so that makes you, you means you can't you actually cannot. just advertise it. But you know what? I bet that a lot of people will use it as a bedroom, maybe for a child or something. They actually do. In a number of the condos I've sold, I've seen families do that for a smaller child. We have one more stop. Do you know what that is? The yeah. bathroom. <laughs> 
don't know, Danny, the water, it's, it's not it's been working for me. No. <laughs> Wendy, this is not a bathroom for you. Oh, uh, well, we gotta get the plumbing going. So a lot of places like this, which are, you know, this one is $100,000, in this price range, is there a lot of plumbing and electrical work that needs to be done? Greg, a friend of mine, gave me an estimate of about 20,000, and that's on the low end. 20,000 for everything. For everything. We're not, well, we're not talking about a wolf stove. We're not getting a wolf right. stove no. or the Viking. I mean, no. But this is basically to make it someplace that's comfortable. Yeah, comfortable. comfortable. So, Danny, what would you say to people who just take a look around at everything here and they just they feel so overwhelmed and they think, I could never really do anything with this? I always say to them, come with me. Let me show you something. I'll come with you. Great. <laughs> Follow me. Wow, you can tell the difference. So she's done some major work in here, but it's roughly the same size apartment. Roughly the same size, a uh, little different uh, configuration, but this can be done. New wood floors, kitchen's been redone, yes. bedrooms, paint job, exposed brick. This is what that $100,000 apartment wants to grow up to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, Alyssa, but the first thing I want to get my hands on is the flooring yes. in here. What okay. would you like, if we were, what would you do here? Well, I mean, okay, if you wanted to just do basic, I mean, we could, look, this comes up pretty easily, and the face is fine. So we could just do a typical vinyl flooring. Just put, put back down new stuff of yeah. what's here now. Exactly. Or, you know, I was looking at the wood flooring they've done in some of the apartments yeah. next door. We could probably think about doing some of that. That would be great. And if you want it to be eco-friendly, you could lay down bamboo and that would look gorgeous. Yeah, that's good. Sustainable. Recycling is always good. And you know what? Speaking yeah. of recycling, not long ago, I taught you guys about how you can make your own custom barrel of wine. But what do you do with all those barrels when you're done? Guess what? We found a guy who makes recycled wine barrel furniture. While we look at this flooring, check it out. They're a staple of winemaking, the oak barrel, as integral to crafting a wine's bouquet and taste as the winemaker. And for some, they're also a great place to enjoy a glass of wine. So as I saw these barrels and we were pulling them apart, I looked at the, the amazing shape of the stave by itself. And then you look at all of them and they're all different widths and depending on the barrel, um, different lengths and different toasts because the barrels get toasted on the inside. And it was so perfect that you not only have a tasteful table or object, but you have the flavor of the Napa Valley that's baked into it. In one of his second acts, celebrity chef Michael Chiarello is taking what would be wine waste and giving wine barrels their own second act. Via Napa Style, the home and food products retailer he opened in 2000. The first product we created at Napa Style was just a serving vessel where we served crostini and bruschetta and small appetizers on these staves. Due to popularity, Napa Style expanded its stave offerings to furniture in 2006, with Adirondack chairs, bar stools, and kitchen islands among the most popular. Items range in price from about $70 to over $1,000. We call it a double bottom line because it's good for the planet and good for our business at the same time. Much like a good chef who uses all of his ingredients wisely, Chiarello's Napa-style stave furniture is doing its part for the environment by saving about 4,000 barrels a year, some used for just 12 months or one vintage, from landfills. And while new barrels may cost several thousand dollars, used barrels are easy and inexpensive to pick up. The repurposed aspect of the wine barrel collections seem to resonate with Napa style customers who are interested in vintage items that tell a story. Stave sales make up 4 to 5 percent of overall revenue. Yeah, a tree goes through this life cycle of, of, of growing some oak and then, like I said, all the artistry that goes into making this, um, it seems silly not to, not to find a second life from it. Made from oak and designed to last for decades, wine barrels are soaked in water and kiln dried in their initial processing, making the wood durable and good for use outside. In their second life as furniture, the staves are crafted by artisans into a variety of furniture. It keeps the memories fresh of your holiday, so a, a week in the Napa Valley um, can last a decade. I don't know, Alyssa, I mean, of all the places in here, the kitchen needs the most work. I mean, there's not even a refrigerator. This is an excellent point, Wendy. I mean, where are we supposed to put all our fresh vegetables? All our fresh vegetables, that's what we need. We need a refrigerator, we need all sorts of appliances. Absolutely. They don't have to be high end. No, I also want a little more cabin space. I mean, Definitely. I mean, if you have a family, this is not enough for everything. What's great about cabinets, Wendy, is that you can go, you know, sort of 
budget and do a laminate type of cover, or you can go upscale and get some really nice cherry oak cabinets in here. We have water. We have running water. You can have cabinets and water in a kitchen. And running water. We have to do a little bit more work before we get Gail Monaghan over here. Yes. You know what? She's going to teach us how to make meringue. Ooh. She's doing it right now. I'm cooking confidential. I think I'm going to fill it with coffee ice cream and whipped cream and put chocolate sauce on the top. Okay, so I'm gonna whip egg whites, and we're gonna turn these egg whites into meringue. Making meringue is whipping the egg whites to put in a souffle. It's basically all the same process. So the first thing is you have your egg whites, which are in this bowl, and they have to be room temperature. They can even be slightly warm. They absolutely don't wanna be cold. So you've separated your eggs when they're cold because they separate better, but then you wanna whip your egg whites when they're room temperature. So in this bowl, I have four egg whites. I'm gonna put in a big pinch of salt, and I'm going to have a whisk, the whisk attachment to a speeder. But it's fine if you do it with the whisk attachment of a handheld electric mixer. By hand with a whisk, it's really sure. Turn it on low. Now that's another important thing in whisking egg whites, is you start it on a low speed and you slowly raise the speed. Once it begins to get a little bit foamy, just a little bit, you add cream of tartar. This is not necessary, but it's really, really helpful. In the olden days, they always whisked egg whites in copper bowls because there was some chemical the copper gave off that helped the egg whites expand. And whatever cream of tartar is, which I'm a little unclear, it um, does the same thing as the copper. So you don't have to do it, but it really, really helps. Raise the speed a little bit. And really, it's just a waiting process. So what you're going to do is you're going to slowly raise the speed. And once the egg whites become opaque, you start adding the sugar really, really, really slowly. So now it's time to add the sugar. You add it a little bit at a time at the beginning. Some people say you add a tablespoon at a time. You can also just add it like that, you know, just in a slow, steady stream. Okay, so now all the sugar is in. You raise the speed all the way up. Let's look at this. You turn it off. You check it. Yeah, these are nice soft peaks like this or a little less would be what you'd want to fold it into a souffle or a cake. But to have it be meringues, you do want it stiffer. So you're gonna turn the mixer back on, and you beat it for a couple more minutes. We're gonna put in a little vanilla, probably in this case about a half a teaspoon. At this point, you could, instead of vanilla, you could have put in coffee, instant espresso powder, which would have made a coffee meringue. You could have put in cocoa, sifted cocoa, to make a chocolate meringue. When you know that the meringue is plenty stiff, you can see that the peaks are stiff, you turn it off, yeah, that's very stiff. Stiff, stiff, stiff. Okay. So, now here's a trick. You have a piece of parchment paper and a cookie sheet. This is what you're going to cook the meringue on. So you make these little dabs. It's going to be like glue. You turn it over, and this is going to make the, meringue, the paper stick to the cookie sheet, because otherwise what happens is when you start putting the meringue on it, the paper wants to come up. So the next thing you do is you take your beater, and you get all the meringue off of it, okay? Then you take the rest of the meringue. What I'm gonna do is make one big meringue shell. And really, if you follow the steps I told you, it will always be perfect meringue. Meringue is not hard to do. People are scared of it, but they're wrong. It's very easy. You can just make it into any shape you want. But see, when I was doing this, if I hadn't stuck the paper down, the paper would start sliding around. All right, I'm just gonna make it into kind of a bowl because later I'm gonna fill it. And I'm gonna put it in the oven, a 200 degree oven. And you really want to cook it a long time. I'll probably leave it in there maybe six, seven hours, and then I'll turn it off and leave it in there overnight. Just so you see what they look like when they're finished, I made different sizes for you to see. And these, this is like a meringue cookie. And this could be an individual meringue. You could fill it with fruit or with ice cream or with fruit and ice cream. And this one you could fill similarly with fruit or fruit and ice cream, fruit and ice cream and whipped cream. And you could, then this one, you cut it like a cake into individual portions. Also, how come I cut 
that's so with this job. I don't no, know. I give up. I just want to buy a new toilet. Let's just buy a new toilet and a new sink. I think we can do that. I mean, you know, maybe we wouldn't even need a new actual sink, but just some paint down here, some really good uh, Clorox bleach. All right, but I definitely want a new toilet. All right, you I'm, get I'm the toilet. Up. I'm done. And uh, tiling, we could do tiling? Yes, absolutely. Tiling's great because, again, it's one of those that you can go really cheap. You can just replace with some better white, or you can get something that's a lot more high-end. We could get some glass box yeah. fashion no, here. That's a good point. It'd be fun. You know, what's interesting about this apartment is they didn't even bother to stage it, but Kelsey Hubbard, she recently went in and look at, looked at one languishing listing on the market that was totally saved by the staging job they did. Let's look at that now. Selling real estate in this market can be tough. Even high-end apartments need help, so some people turn to professional stagers. I'm Kelsey Hubbard here on Park Avenue at a luxury building where we're going to see how it's done. Come on, let's check it out. So we're here at this Park Avenue penthouse apartment and we're going to talk to Cheryl Eisen of Interior Marketing Group to tell us how she staged this apartment to move. Come on, let's go meet her. Hi Cheryl. Hi Kelsey. How are you? Kelsey Hubbard. Nice to meet wow, you. Wow, great Welcome apartment. Welcome to the penthouse. To the penthouse. So this is an interesting uh, dynamic for a lot of people who aren't used to selling high-end real estate and this idea of staging an apartment. So tell us what you do. Well basically most apartments we stage are empty. They've been on the market for a while, unsold, no offers. And we come in and transform them into livable, luxurious homes. All right, so tell us what you did uh, here. We're going to start in this dining area, which is right off when you walk in the door. This is actually just an empty gallery, and the owner had it just as a, an art gallery. There was no functionality to it, which I think inhibits a sale because you want to see every space if you're paying for it, you right. know, and how you can function in it. So we made it into a, for a formal dining area. All right, so take us through the living room and why you added some of the pieces that you did here and what would appeal to the potential buyer of this home. Well, this is a very luxurious sofa. It's, it's a like $13,000 sofa. So it's very, you know, and it's white, so it sort of blends in. It doesn't take you away from the beauty of the room. I also love, obviously, to add tons of mirrors because, you know, it makes it feel much more spacious and light. And are all these uh, items very expensive or could people go and buy some of these to add to what they have already existing in their apartment just to make it nicer for a sale? You know, you'd be surprised. What we do is we add inexpensive items like all of these mirrors, believe it or not, are from Ikea. Um, oh, okay. with expensive items like the sofa and this coffee table and the Jonathan Adler stuff. Right. Um, and then other things are from like Daffy's, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> like that console there. So um, it's a mix of high and low. It is a mix. And you know what? You'd never know if you really have high-end stuff with low-end stuff. A lot of high-end, luxurious apartments in New York have outdoor space, which needs staging as well. So you've come out here to this terrace. Tell us what you've done here to make it li a livable space. Well, this terrace, it's gorgeous already. It had all these wonderful trees and plants, but there was nothing else. It was just, you know, the ground. So we brought in a beautiful lounge, and when you put, like, outdoor carpeting and tables, it feels like you can really lounge out here and read a book. It's, it's more cozy and comfy. So people can envision how they would use their outdoor space. Exactly, or you picture a party at night here. But also there's a level of comfort when you come out here. I wouldn't want, like, a dining scene. I like a cozy, comfy, you know, outdoor lounge. And if people ever come to you and say, you know, once you've staged it, they're like, I like the way it looks, I want to buy all this furniture from you? Surprisingly, that happens. And uh, the place <laughs> doesn't sell, the people just take their apartment back. It sells to the seller. Have you ever had a situation where, no matter what you've done to an apartment, it just hasn't sold? Not yet, thank goodness. The first thing that definitely needs to be done is a little cleaning. I had to plunge the toilet. You get to mine, I'll mop. In the meantime, I'm going to head out to the store, get a little joint compound. We're going to need that. I'm going to start to work on those walls. That's it for today. WSJ off duty. Please click above to subscribe. Join us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Wendy Bounce. I'll see you tomorrow. I cannot promise that this apartment is going to be completely renovated, but you know what? It's going to be a lot cleaner. Come on, keep going. Hi, all right.